I have the greatest job in the world. Tell me what it feels as someone who doubted his own career and now people, real people are showing up, paying for an event to come watch a documentary. I love that people are connecting with the pieces I'm doing. I don't take it for granted for a second. You went on Adam 22 show. You see a lot of people who kind of act like you're doing some culture vulture shit. I think the whole term is mostly ridiculous. Whose culture am I vulturing when these guys are inviting me in to put their story on? The argument here is like, oh, Tommy, a white guy, is getting views off of a black people problem. So I lost money for four or five years on YouTube when I started. I withstood like the temptation to quit yeah. multiple times. I weathered the storm yeah. and now all of a sudden when it's doing well, people want to attack. So anyone that says that usually is sitting on the bleachers and people can boo from the bleachers, but I'm in the field playing the game. Look around and see what's going on. Tell me what it feels as someone who doubted his own career back in the day and you did not know that you were gonna make it. You know, you were a salesman. You did not know you were gonna like put food on the table. From then you built a YouTube channel. You actually put stories on the map and now people, real people are showing up, paying for an event to come watch a documentary. What does that feel like? I have the greatest job in the world and I love that people are connecting with the pieces I'm doing. I love that they're growing with me because even if you look at a year and a half, the documentaries we were doing compared to now, we're still leveling up. We're young in this game. I, I have the best job in the world and I know it only exists because people pay attention. So I don't take it for granted for a second. What, is your, what does your wife feel like about all this? I'm just curious. Sarah, sweet cheeks. <laughs> He I had a question for you. Okay. I have like followed his career for a long time and I know that he built all of this like one day at a time, brick by brick. Yeah, like five years, six years in the making. How did it feel to stand by him during this whole thing and now watching him put together a real show at a real event and all these people showing up in person? What does it feel like? I mean, I'm just really proud of him. It's like watching somebody's dreams come true. Yeah. It's just really special and watching him evolve like going from doing the comedy bits to now yeah. doing something that he's like always been passionate about and talked about it's tom's a dreamer but he's also like very assertive and like pursuant in what he really wants to do sarah is the glue behind the operation like i get to go out and do all these crazy things and then i come home to such a safe stable like That's loving so home awesome. yeah, no. and she <laughs> holds everything down behind the scenes. Yeah. Like she runs the merch operation, she runs yeah. the finance operation. Like she is so key to what I do yeah. and the channel would be a fraction of what it is. So um, luckily <laughs> we found each other. I asked him this one thing, I'm from New York and I see like, you know, like famous people every day, but I it's so rare for me to see someone who is this loved in their hometown mm -hmm. and in their local community. I don't know, are you from Milwaukee as well? Minneapolis. We've but been I've here the been, last yeah, 10, 12 years. So like, decade, what so. does it feel like that Tommy is like so loved, it, not only like in YouTube in general, but like also in his community? I mean, I think he's a really lovable guy. He's just that authentically himself. And I think that's really rare, especially now everybody wants to like put on a front all the time. And yeah. he's just authentically himself. He's not embarrassed to do the things that he loves and do things that make him comfortable. Mm. And that's, I think, huge. And that makes people like drawn to him. Yeah, yeah, too. yeah. I don't have any agenda with people. I don't have an angle. I'm not out to get people. I just want to genuinely learn about their life and figure out what makes them tick. And I think it comes across when I talk to them. What fascinates me like so much about you is, uh, I mean, I, I live in New York. Before that, I used to live in DC. Like, I went to journalism school. I'm as much of a suit as it comes when it comes to like capital J journalism. And I'm always interested in meeting people who are, who have the same mission. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm 27. Mm -hmm. So I get where you want like news and journalism to be. My question to you is like, why, like, you didn't go to journalism school. Like, how did you get interested in all this? How did I get into journalism? Well, I think. It stems from the love of reading. Okay. I've been reading books, every book I can get my hands on since the time I was a young kid. And so when you have a passion for and love for reading, there's all there's an endless amount of things that you want to explore in this world. And so it just follows naturally that I want to explore all these different stories and make that a job. I'm trying to like picture you back in the day, a guy who is a salesman and who has this dream of making documentaries, like hardcore news journalism documentaries and just like knocking on this door and you still don't know what you want to do with your life. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that transition from like 
being a salesman mm -hmm. and having this dream, but you want to protect this dream at the same time you want to put food on your table. Yeah. What was that time of your life like? So, I knew the whole time I had my corporate job that I wanted to get out of there yeah. and I was willing to do there was a few different things I thought I was going to do to get out of it. It could have been coaching wrestling, it could have been real estate, or it could have been YouTube. Yeah. And it just so happened, like I kept those fires alive. Yeah. I knew I had to get financially independent to remove myself from the sales yeah. world. So it was always a mission to be you know, frugal with my money, yeah. to invest it, and also to try and make money making, and also to try and make money doing things I love. Yeah. So I was doing private lessons and running a little uh, wrestling team out in Brookfield, or you know, I got my first property uh, probably four, three, four years into the job, I bought a, a fourplex. Nice. And I just knew that the pieces were going to start slowly building. But then when something takes off, like the Keyboy video did, that's when you start sprinting for it full time. And so I got fired from a job February 2022. Keyboy video launched July 2022. And from that point on, this has been the path. Why did you go with the Kia Boys video? Like, what about the Kia Boys video? A, it's super risky, mm -hmm. and B, uh, it's kind of like an uncharted territory. Like, mm -hmm. no, like until you kind of like put it on the map, no one was really like talking about it in like the news world. Mm -hmm. So, what about the story attracted you? Well, I think to give you an idea of my perspective on the world, like my uncle said of me growing up that the world is his locker room or playground. Like, I feel comfortable wherever I am. Yeah, it's your and so. Being in uncharted territory to me is just, well, why aren't, why aren't we going into this place? Yeah. Um, people always were doing videos about the victims of the Kia boys, but they never talked to the actual Kia boys themselves. No one thought to interview them. These kids are pretty, they love posting about it. They yeah. post on TikTok, their Instagrams. You'd be amazed at the amount of guys doing really sketchy shit that, like I have a, a fentanyl dealer in my pocket right now that keeps hitting me up. When is this dropping? When is yeah. it dropping? I can't wait. I'm telling all my friends I want to see it. What leads them down that path? And this gets thrown around a lot, which is like being a product of your environment. And it can be a cop out, but at the same time, yeah. there is truth to it. There is truth. So I think it's a big mix. I think it's um, these kids are growing up in these incredibly economically depressed areas where Back in their grandparents' area, Milwaukee was booming. Had a very strong middle class. Then all the jobs went overseas. Houses started getting boarded up. So they're growing up in this environment where everywhere they look, there's trash. There's boards on the windows. There's very there's very little dads in the household. Yeah. Um, so they're in chaotic environments because usually mom's at work. Yeah. Then they have free reign of the house. Or if mom's not working, that's not a good example to follow either. Um, culturally in Milwaukee... There's also like, I mean, there's certain things that fly in certain areas that produce that environment. Like obviously something's fucked up if there's hundreds of teenage boys stealing cars, crashing them. Like they literally, I, my ex-girlfriend had her car stolen and we were trying to track it down. We triangulated it because her purse was in the car and they were trying to buy blunt wraps at three different gas stations. So we knew exactly the area they were. We didn't find it, but a few hours later, the cops called us. We go to the scene. It was wrecked. So these guys aren't doing it to make money. They aren't doing it because they're trying to go to work or go to A to B. They're doing it purely for the enjoyment of it. Yeah. And they have zero thought to whether it affects you, me, or anyone else. Mm -hmm. So there's something fucked up culturally if that's happening on a wide basis. Yeah. And I want to go back to, because I'm fascinated by like history in general. And you said, Milwaukee, I've never been here. It's my first time here. And you said like jo the jobs left. Like my friend, he's from Michigan. Like mm -hmm. a lot of jobs from Michigan left. Um, having made these stories and having studied that part of time, what effect do you think that had writ large on day-to-day -day lives? Jobs disappearing overseas. Correct. It, I mean, it was the collapse of, uh, of the family too because um, at one point you had a lot of, especially men, but also women, men that could support their families, men that were the magnets that kept their family housed and they were able to invite people over and invite them in. And then all of a sudden, men, I think, feel lost because there's no role for them to play. And over time, the role that they were to play, you know, the guys that are kind of respected in the hood are respected in the hood, but not respected other ways. Like a drug dealer is not really respected in the suburbs. That guy's a piece of shit. But maybe in the hood, he's the man, he's the baller, he's got the fashion, he's got some, you know, he's got motion yeah. and so kids look up to him. And so I think what happened is like the, de the degradation, degradation of a role model happened when the jobs went overseas. Men need 
responsibility, purpose, belonging. And what would for a long time had been that got wiped off the map and what replaced it isn't so good. Why do you think this doesn't get talked about in like mainstream culture? It's sensitive because, well, one, like if you want to go woke mainstream media, even let's, because right now we're talking about mostly black Milwaukee. I mean, yeah. this isn't really happening as much in the South side or the East side. And so even being a white guy talking about it, you're not supposed to have an opinion, even if you've seen it. Um, and then like in the narrative, let me just, let me point out like this. Yeah. If there was a leak in a house, let's say there's two leaks. One leak is 99.9% .9 of the leak. One leak is 0.1%. Which leak should we address? The first one. Okay. Right now in the media, we're addressing 0.1%, which is the cop killings, which yeah. are terrible. But if you look at the numbers, that's 0.1% of the leak. Mm -hmm. Not to say every cop that does something wrong and kills an unarmed person should go to prison, should be handled in the justice system. But that's like 15 to 18 cases a year. Homicides in the black community are the 99.9% .9 of the leak. And we don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable or it's, well, you can't comment on it or they can't comment. I mean, you get where I'm going with yeah, this? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. To me, I think that we should be able to look at something in the eyes and really we have an honest conversation about it. And right now, where we are in the media, it's being avoided. I'm thinking a lot here and I think you not coming from like the capital J journalism world is your superpower. And because yeah. uh, being from the journalism world, that kind of like prohibits you to like talk a certain way and get into certain topics. I know that. And uh, it's amazing though, it's, isn't it? When you think that if you've gone to a, the highest regarded journalism school in the country that you yeah. come out fucking firing, ready to go dive in. Yeah. Like the thing about like journalism and like just media and like the coastal cities or whatever, it's cause like, it's such a closed circle and they're hardworking people. Uh, they think that they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are my friends, but. <laughs> but they're almost all, it seems like yeah. a lot of them are subscribing to an agenda and yeah. they're all like, there's no dissension. Like you have to check these boxes yeah. to fit in the line. And it's weird when you don't, like we talk about, we want diversity. How about diversity yeah. of thoughts and opinions and perspective? A lot of it doesn't happen because we don't like to like leave our little cities mm -hmm. and we don't meet people. And yeah. Yeah, that's why I like to like come out of the city as much as I can. And it's pretty ironic because I am not from this country. I wasn't born here, but that's why it makes me like super exciting to meet people every fucking city of the country. Yeah. Um, that's why I made this trip. And to go back to like the Kia boys time, um, when we were on the phone, you asked me this question. It was like, Hey man, so this journalist called me after the whole Kia boys thing. And they asked me this question. It was like, Hey, so what do you think about like smiling with them? Why were you like in a photo with them? Like, like you're pretty like chill with them and you're not like reprimanding them. A, in that moment, how did that make you feel that you did such an amazing piece of work and this is the kind of reception you're getting? I was so caught off guard and shocked. Yeah. Because, well, first of all, the phone conversation leading in led me to believe that she thought it was a great piece and she was mm -hmm. really interested to talk to me about mm -hmm. it. And then instead, she just spears me with the first few questions. And so what I was thinking is, I don't know if she could tell when she was watching that video, but Mr. Ebrake had a little pole in his <laughs> pocket. and. If she has the balls to go in there, yeah. Hey, shake the finger at them, yeah. reprimand them. I don't know, citizens arrest. Yeah. I'll watch it and that'll be visiting her funeral afterwards. Yeah. Or you know, or she'll get the shit kicked out of her. Yeah. I mean, that th that's the thing is when people accuse you, get mad at you for things that they don't have them themselves, the the strength or the the balls to do is like it's just kind of funny to me. Like in retrospect it's ridiculous, but in the moment it was like, why is she attacking me? What is going on? I thought we were on the same team. What do you What do you think like the city thought of you in general at that time? I think a lot of people were like, we're glad that it's being talked about. Yeah. Uh, I would say the overwhelming majority, and if you look at my, my comment sections or all my videos, I would say overwhelming majority of people, comments are very positive. Yeah. I think people wanted to hear about it and they were happy that we revealed what they think, what these Kia boys think, because a lot of them are like, why are they doing this? Why are they acting like this? And then when he answered like, we, yeah, we don't care about you. We do it for fun. like, people were like, okay, this confirms what we thought. And that was nice to hear a small percentage more of the activism community, which is another community that are like, I usually find laughable because most of the time they spend the t their entire life pointing their finger at everyone else but themselves. Yeah. Um, but a couple of activists were like, hey, yo, like why is a white guy shoot, uh, you know, filming a black guy? Yeah. Well, one, I was invited. Yeah. Two, I talked to them, they said, okay. Yeah. And three, 
Like they like they're like, oh, you're exploiting these kids. Okay, I want to get into that. Yeah. What the one thing I did learn from the keyboard yeah. video was not to shoot with minor. So that is okay. my error. Okay, yeah. We were so new to it that we didn't yeah, really yeah, have yeah. our boundaries. That's fine. Yeah. So my, minors do some really reckless shit. After that, we realized we don't do that anymore. So yeah. that was my mistake. But as far as the exploitation piece, what I find hilarious about that. These people that would accuse me of exploitation will never say to the kid that's stolen 200 cars, yeah. how many people didn't have insurance on those cars? Yeah. How many people may have gotten evicted because they can't go to their job to pay their rent anymore because they don't have a car? And this is largely in their own community. Yeah. That's not exploiting someone, yeah. but I am because I'm asking why they do it. Give me a fucking break. Feel free to like literally plead the fifth here because I know it's like a tricky topic, which is you went on you know, Adam 22 show, and yeah. he called you out for being a culture washer. He said and people may have thought, yeah, yeah, that it's, guy it's is such a cop out. And, yeah. you know, like, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the first time I learned about this term was when people called Post Malone a culture washer. Mm -hmm. I love Post Malone, and people were like, oh, yeah, he's a white guy, he's rapping, he shouldn't be doing that, whatever. Yeah. So, it's, it's a, a way people want to gatekeep. It's, it's, it's a gatekeeping thing, but yes. like, you specifically tell me what it, how it felt like to, being called a culture war show when all you wanted to do was, you know, like put this story on the map. Well, first of all, when Adam 22 said it, he's a, a I, I like him. I've hung out with him. He's nice in person. Yeah. I've had a good time with him. So I'm not here to disparage him. But when, he, when you're on a show, it's content first. The yeah. questions are not, he doesn't talk to you like a friend. He talks to you like, what's going to be the hook question that I'm going to ask? I didn't hear anyone call me a culture vulture, but he made a suggestion of it. Um, but what I think about it, I think the whole term is mostly ridiculous. Uh, one, if, let's just say how it applies to me. I'm invited in to a ton of different places, whether it's native reservations, hoods, cartel, like smugglers. They invite me in and I act like myself. I don't come in acting like I'm a little bow wow with a chain and I talk a different way. I'm undeniably myself. So whose culture am I vulturing when these guys are inviting me in to put their story on and also like, I try to make people look the best they can. I don't try yeah. to hit piece people. So I'm flying three guys out to make a video that's probably going to get one to three million views. I'll promote your, if you're a rapper, I'm going to promote your music. I could charge labels a good chunk of change for that. I don't, yeah. I've, I don't do pay for play. Yeah. So that's another thing about my channel is my channel doesn't work off of talking to famous people or the people TMZ is chasing around. My channel... I have videos that are with rappers with 200 followers that get more views than some of the famous rappers I've worked with. So I don't just hand pick like the celebrities to talk to. I'll talk to a guy that's releasing his first song as long as he can bring me in and show me a world that I, he wants to show, you know, that's interesting to see. But the cultural appropriation thing overall, I think is ridiculous. Like where do we want to draw the line? And this is the point I drew, brought up on M22. If you're not German, can you eat bratwurst? If you're not uh, Greek, can you run a marathon? Do who invented electricity? Can no other like if a Polish guy did it? Can no one else use it? Like where do we want to draw the line here? Because if you're gonna draw the line, then let's draw it everywhere. And I don't think it would stack up yeah. good because then no one would be able to use anything because we'd only be able to. And then what? Like can it only if I'm a Polish man, can I only do what a Polish person has invented, but yeah. or just a Polish man? Yeah. Or just a Pol like how far down the category I mean, do you want to go? I'm gonna play the devil's advocate here. Sure. And basically the argument here is like oh. Uh, Tommy, a white guy, is getting views off of a uh, black people problem. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you say to that? And connected to views, people will say money, correct? correct? Yeah. So I lost money for four or five years on YouTube when I started. Yeah. I, I never did this because I thought, like, I, I am making money now that I never thought I could make in my life. Yeah. But that was never the motivation to do YouTube. I just wanted to, I just wanted to replace my day job income <laughs> doing something that I actually cared about. Yeah. So I lost money. I invested into the, the channel. I withstood like the temptation to quit yeah. multiple times. I weathered the storm yeah. and now all of a sudden when it's doing well, people want to attack. But I didn't really ever change my approach because yeah. I started making money. Actually, I feel like I doubled down on my approach yeah. when I started making money. So um, like that, I, I, uh, there was a black kid in a college class. I go, I, any like teacher in Milwaukee that asked me to speak to their kid, I go and talk to them. And there's a, a kid in a college class like, what do you got to say? Like, let's address the elephant in the room that you a white guy. And I'm like, okay. And, and he didn't grow up here. Yeah. So what does that mean? I'm only allowed to cover people in the city I grew up in that, yeah. that are white. Yeah. Like how many boxes do you want to place me in? Yeah. Um, the other thing I'll remind people of is the guy that questioned me, how many DMs do you get inviting for people to invite you to visit them? Yeah. I bet none. I get a lot. So I go where I'm invited. I don't go, I don't show up anywhere that people don't want me. 
and ask the people that I work with, I'm invited back again. So they, they see, they enjoy working with me. We've built a relationship and I provide value to them. So anyone that says that usually is sitting on the bleachers and people can boo from the bleachers, but I'm in the field playing the game. And no one I know in the field playing the game really says stuff like that. Do you, do you like, if you had to like put a label on yourself right now, what would you call yourself? Uh, I would say documentary filmmaker, um, a guy that explores the underworld, a guy that tries to connect and humanize people that you might not view as a good person or worthy of being, I don't know, being treated well. Okay. Uh, why, why is that last part important to you? Because you could ideally just be like a journalist or just a documentary, putting the story. I would say documentary filmmaker is the quickest way. I'd yeah, say. yeah, yeah. But like, you know, like you said, like humanize these folks. Um, and there's this angle in all your videos, which is like anytime you talk to someone, let's say, who is risky or shady or whatever, you try to show them in a lens which kind of like tries to empathize with them a little bit. I guess to me, it's not like like any sort of attempt. It's just how how I naturally come. talk. Yeah. I'm not there to attack anybody. They're inviting me into their life and I'm going to just genuinely ask questions and figure out who they are. Yeah. So to me, like there's no reason to be hostile. There's no reason to be judgmental. I don't know them. Who am I to say anything about them? I'm just here to figure out who they are, what makes them tick. Why? Why are you interested in Because I'm fascinated by people. There's an endless amount of people. Like even after the show, people came up, hey, there's a guy that uh, runs a midget wrestling <laughs> ring and he's a midget and he yeah. wants you to talk yeah, to him yeah. cool i would love to dive into your world yeah right now i'm sifting through emails about going out to reservations in winnipeg and uh pine ridge and all these places cool yeah. i want to figure out when we can do that so um to me i want to experience interesting lives that are different than mine yeah i'm not really here to profile you know bob the accountant that wears the same pants every day shows up nine to five i mean i'm happy there's yeah. people out there but i want to dive into these worlds that are fascinating i know a lot of bobs uh, and good for the bobs. Yeah. We need bobs, but yeah. I'm not going to do a documentary. Uh, that's no. right. Uh, hard tangent. Uh, let's get into like your personal life a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure like what was life growing up for you, mm -hmm. but you said that you really wanted to make up for your day job. Basically, all you wanted to do was basically do this, and, and this will be your living. Yeah. Tell me about like what's your relationship with money now? Now that you have done all that. I've always been frugal and, and investment minded, even when I didn't have any money to really invest. So yeah. I, like, I remember in college, being in the library, looking up blogs like Mr. Money Mustache oh, yeah. and yeah. <laughs> you know, Bigger Pockets, yeah, just yeah. figuring out how to play the game, knowing that eventually when I, I knew I was gonna finally make money one day, yeah. that I'd be ready to, to play. Um, so my relationship with money is, is really savvy, I would say. It's something that's a passion of mine. Like investing is really important to me. So yeah. like and I, to be diversified, whether it be mutual funds, crypto, real estate, yeah. investing into the channel, investing into, um, you know, making our videos better and better. But to me, money is a way to break the chains. Yeah. I don't care if I ever have a Lamborghini or a mansion, but yeah. I do want to do what I want. I do want to do what I want to do. Yeah. I mean, the way to look at money in like the, you know, like the cynical way is like, you know, like money is a scoreboard. Like money yeah. is how you kind of like keep a track of your wins. Mm -hmm. And once the channel started doing well, you could like, you know, justify to yourself, okay, like this is working, right? And you can like expand on it. Like you asked your wife to quit her job mm -hmm. and join the team and mm -hmm. you hired people and we are surrounded by merch and all that stuff. You mm -hmm. can do all that because you were making like money from YouTube and all that stuff. Like how did it feel like that? that is a possibility. It's like sometimes people take this for granted because, oh, I'll make money from YouTube. I'm like, yeah. like, just think about what you're asking right now. <laughs> I mean, especially so many years of failing yeah, and losing yeah, money. Yeah. yeah, it blows my mind every day on the 21st when that YouTube check comes in, it's like, Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. But um, like it gives you more of a responsibility now. Like what are you going to build for your family? What are you going to build for your community? Yeah. And how are you going to leverage that money? Like to me, being rich is this. Maybe I'll get a you know five bedroom house eventually. I want a place that guests can come in and stay and feel comfortable. Yeah. I want it to be the place that invite, I invite all the boys in that they're they're we I can feed them dinner. Yeah. We can hang around the table. Yeah. And that to me is being wealthier. Being able to look at an Airbnb and say, oh my family can have a really cool experience. We can hike in this area. I'm gonna book it. I'm not worried about the price. But I'm not a flashy guy. Yeah. I don't waste my money on stupid stuff. I'm not trying to impress you with you know material things. Um, 
And I also know that money can go away. I'm making yeah. money now, but I feel like I've almost put myself in a position where I'm, pre I'm pretty hard to hire. Yeah. So I don't know if I could get a real job if this goes to shit. So I'm putting myself in a position that yeah. when this does end, yeah. that I'm okay. And also like, I think you have, a, cause a lot of people have views online, but not a lot of people have this relationship which you have with the audience. Mm -hmm. And when you like throw events like yesterday's and like 200 people show up, that's like a proof of concept. Like even if like YouTube goes away, whatever you do next, like those people will still be rooting for Tommy. Maybe, YouTube, I feel like if YouTube went away, it'd be really hard to leverage that. Though. Yeah, yeah. Cause yeah. that's where they come and see me. So um, YouTube is a huge piece of the puzzle. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, and it was nice to see people. I mean, I, I didn't know if we were gonna sell one ticket or a million. I really don't know what to expect for this event. So I'm pleased that it went the way it was it did. great. Yeah. And um, you said family a lot. Um, tell me like, you know, like YouTubers blow up, they move to fucking LA or New York or whatever. I'll never move. <laughs> uh, okay. Why? Yeah. Why would you move? LA is like to me like the last place on earth I think I'd ever <laughs> live. Everything about it, like the, like one people that call themselves influencers, like the people that like, they won't talk to you unless you have a certain amount of follow. Like that type of shit is just so, it's just not the Midwest ethic that I grew up with. But I would say family is so important to me. One, I structure my job so that I can be here as much as possible. Okay, that's I awesome. travel minimally. Yeah. Two, like I feel like I tr my team is like a, uh, a family. When we travel, that's what one of the you YouTubers you saw in the video, Arab, he said, what stuck out to me, I've seen a lot of different YouTubers and how their team is structured. You guys operate like a family. So, you know, we, we get into the Airbnb, we cook, we, we share the responsibilities in the house. We are always con talking and talking about ideas and how we can be better and what we should ask and how we should approach things. So. That's really what I'm trying to build is like a really tight knit community with everything I do. And about like your family specifically, you just had a baby. Does that change your approach to what you do for a living? Uh, it makes my, it makes, I'm, I'm pretty efficient with my trips, but it makes yeah. the, uh, the need to be even more efficient because yeah. every extra day I'm gone and you know, my wife has to handle yeah. it on her own. It, it's a big job. Not so, just the time spent. I'm talking about approach, the danger. Yeah, yeah, not at all. To me, yeah. Um, like when I talk to my mom about this stuff, like, is she excited about some of the danger? No, it's just, she like, there's some videos she can't watch. Yes. But she knows that, I mean, she, she views the world in a Christian lens. So she knows yeah. this is what God called me to do. Yeah. And I'm happy and I'm alive and I'm going after things. And so nothing's going to change. I obviously have to make sure each time that I'm putting myself in a position that I make a home. Okay. Um, and things are, can always happen, but, um, to me, it doesn't change any of the approach or danger, as long as I vet the contacts and make sure we're set up. Yeah. Do you ever like step back and think about like America in general and the fact that yeah. it has like these kind of like stories just hanging out? It's and amazing. Yeah, it's just, it's a crazy thing. And I'm, America's a great place to live for this field. Yeah, it's, it's a great place. And like, there's a story like every day, like I live in New York, so like that's like its own place, but- New York is a place you could go two or three times a year and cover four or five stories every time you go there. Yeah, and but like in general, like when you're traveling, cause this has happened to me a lot, like back in the day when I used to work for documentarians, I used to like go to random places and I was like, no one talks about this. Like no one talks about like, this is a random part of uh, like Texas where there is a rancher who is trying to protect his yard from migrants and it's not getting any help. And at the same time, he's getting like death threats from uh -huh. the local people or whatever. And like, these are like crazy stories and they just like hanging out in the ether mm -hmm. and all it needs is someone to tell that story. Mm -hmm. Honestly, do you ever think about like, what, like that, what is that responsible? Do you think about that when you go to these places? Okay, now I have to tell the story in the most honest way possible. To me, it's not hard to, be, I don't have to like think about being honest. That's, that's how I yeah, operate. Yeah, I want yeah, people, yeah. I want to treat people that way, but I also expect, expect the same return, yeah. whether we're doing business or real estate or whatever. I want us to be sh sh straight shooters with each other. But to me, it's really like, I'm, we're always discovering the new ideas. So I have, a, I have too many ideas right now to execute. Like, it's always like, okay, I can't wait till I'm in South Dakota. I can't wait until I'm in LA. Yeah. Cause I, I know when I go there, there's these four things I want to hit. So it's almost just like enjoying the passage of time that, okay, now I get to do this. And now I get to do that. You know, like looking back, I don't know, like 10 years ago, let's say hypothetically, when you, like you had your basic education, you had a nice 
I'm, I'm guessing you mm. had like a you had a good upbringing mm. and all that. Yeah, really, really great upbringing. But then you know, like you're getting into work life and you're realizing that okay, this is not what I want. There are plenty of people who are in that stage right now and will be forever. <laughs> yeah. But they're trying to navigate what they want to do in life. I met a lot of folks who are like really young at the show yesterday. They were the main thing which they were talking about is like. I want to do what Tommy does, but at the same time, I don't know what interests me right now. Yeah, I think younger people need to be really comfortable with experimentation because yeah. that's how you find out what you love to do. Go into a boxing gym, join a chess club, figure out like what it is that makes you feel really alive when you wake up. Because you can get stuck in these jobs that take your soul. And I know so many of these like office folks that have just surrendered to that. And they like, there's like a classic white guy in the office. Like, oh, how are you doing? <laughs> living the dream. And you know they're dying inside. Yeah. And they tell you they're living the dream. And it's like, okay. Like, I hear you not satisfied with your life. Like, I have a really good friend like this. I've heard for now years, he's not satisfied with where he is. But he's not made one move to like, okay, now I'm going to try this. Or I'm going to save up and try and invest in that. Or like, you have to build up your pieces on the board. And it yeah. takes time and momentum to get there. But if you're not gonna take the time to do it, you're gonna get stuck unless you really make a change. And so I like advise people like, if you feel stuck, start doing things on the side. Start researching other options. Even if I kept a day job for five and a half years yeah. and was building real estate on the side, was doing YouTube on the, on the side. But when it be, there's gonna be a time when you need to make the jump. So. You don't have to like, I'm not saying cut off your income and try something brand new right now. Keep what you got, like keep your bills paid, be able to invest into your craft, but build something so that when it's the time is right, you can transfer. Those lines were drawn yeah. between Americans. White, black, straight, gay, man, woman, non-binary, straight, like whatever you want to say. They started making all these like People that when you just go out in your neighborhood and you just talk to people, you bump they into people, just fine. they're so cool. Yeah. <laughs> but then they, the news wants to tell you that everyone's at odds and at each other's throats. And you're right. That's why they're unforgivable.